Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. We've got a uh, very special guest, uh, my soon-to-be brother, <laughs> Matt Landsberg. So uh, welcome, Matt. Good to have you on, man. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, you're uh, engaged to my uh, young younger sister closest to me, and um, Matt mm-hmm. is an entrepreneur and a franchise owner, a franchisee, I guess you could say, yeah. right? Yeah, thank um, you. A successful business in uh, in New York, and uh, in the midst of all this coronavirus shit, we're going to be talking about how to position yourself if you're an entrepreneur, how to position yourself if you're not, uh, to deal with just the crazy times ahead. And uh, we'll also have some of the guys from the Leverage Group probably chiming on and give weighing in on their two cents. So. Right. Matt, uh, give us kind of a background on your story. You know, um, where'd you go to school? How'd you get into business? And how are things yeah. going, I guess, up until the recent events? Yeah, so uh, so I went to University of Connecticut um, up in stores. Uh, and, you know, I always had an interest in business. My, my father uh, ran a, his own company for a while, um, and which his dad started, my grandfather. Um, he sold it when I was in high school um, to a larger company. He, he was in the wall covering business. And, you know, growing up, I always thought that that's kind of what I was going to do. I was going to go into that business. And, uh, you know, when he sold it, I obviously had to adjust my, uh, you know, my plans. And, uh, you know, my dad, when he sold the company, he always told me that he would help me out. And, uh, you know, we would go into business together because, you know, that was always my plan. And he was, very helpful in that way and he you know continues to be obviously and um so yeah so uh you know when i graduated we started looking at various business ideas and uh you know we first started at uh looking for you know businesses for sale try and buy existing businesses um and you know that was always a a tough route to go um because especially because i didn't really know what field i wanted to go into so franchising just seemed like a natural fit to me uh I didn't want to just go and get a job. I wanted to, you know, do my own thing and have, uh, you know, have my own business where I can travel if I want to, I can, you know, do whatever, which for the first few years was not the case at all because it it was a lot harder work than any other thing you can go into, you know, having to be there, especially in a retail business, um, which I'm in. Um, So let's go into that. Uh, So I I started uh, looking at franchises and, uh, we started with food franchises and uh, we almost opened a, a burger restaurant called Burger Fi, which some of those in the States might know of. Uh, they make really good burgers. It's awesome. But uh, we almost did that. But my, uh, my mom has a background as a nutritionist and she was very uh, anti burger, <laughs> so, so to speak. Uh, so, <laughs> so that burgers idea, aren't healthy. No, they're not. Who, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Weird. Burgers and fries. She just had something. You know what? It was something about it. She just didn't want us selling burgers. Uh, what, what can you Fair do? Enough. Uh, <laughs> so we started looking at other retail businesses, and uh, we found this opportunity uh, with a franchisor called Winmark, which uh, does their resale franchises. Um, they have five different brands. Um, we initially looked at doing. Uh, one of their brands, which is called Played Against Sports, where they buy and sell generally used uh, sporting goods. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge uh, Play It Again uh, oh, yeah. customer, you know, because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big sports guy, and Play It Again Sports always has really good hockey gear. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's, how I, that's how I was familiar with, too, because I play hockey also. And mm-hmm. uh, so I was always into sports and stuff and sporting goods. And so that was, the, you know, one of the first things I was looking at was sporting goods things or something sports related um yeah. you know and that stood out because that was a store that i'd been to and that's you know been around uh for a while and you know when we started discussing with uh winmark which is the franchisor uh you know about play against sports they mentioned that uh this other company plato's closet which is another store that they do which 
buys and sells gently used clothing for teens and young adults, like mall brands and stuff like that. And they mentioned that that was probably a better opportunity right now, um, you know, with just the way the way the retail environment was shaping up to be, uh, you know, resale is starting to get big and it's just been, you know, really growing since then, uh, you know, as people are going away from the malls and you see these certain mall brands going out of business and closing. And, you know, now when you go to a mall, you go past like Hollister and it's you know 50 percent off all jeans always pretty much. So you know, yeah. people are looking for value and you know, especially teenagers and teen girls are always changing their style and, you know, they can't be seen wearing the same thing multiple times, uh, <laughs> you know, and guys, guys do that too, obviously. But um, so it, it just, you know, when, when the opportunity came to us, it just seemed like a much better choice and it was a need in, in Long Island. Uh, there's nothing like this that existed. Uh, so we were well, the it's first a great one. business. Like, just the you know it it's a great business because obviously there's a huge amount of misinformation for both your supply chain which is also your customers you know they're basically just trying to dump old clothes and they're kind of happy to get anything for it you know like if i'm getting rid of of old clothes or old sporting equipment like there's nowhere i can take it besides like play it again I'm not going to waste my time trying to sell it on eBay, you know, like who wants old shit. But then if I'm buying used stuff or like, you know, even if it's not called used, I'm sure it's, it's the, you know, pre-owned or whatever you want to call it. When you buy it from a used, yeah. When you buy it from a store, right. It, it, it's still like when I buy shit from Buffalo exchange, which is a similar sort of, um, you know, buy stuff and resell it place. I used to go to in in Pacific beach. They've got a huge, uh, I think franchise system too. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously, you just feel more comfortable buying what well, you can just go there, right? It's, it's a lot different than buying something off the internet or on eBay You can go and you can try it on, you know, and you feel like you're getting a deal, but at the same time, you guys are getting a way better deal by buying that stuff from people for, I mean, I don't know what you buy it for obviously, but there's, there's gotta be a pretty nice margin there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our typical margin is about like, you know, 65%, which is, Damn. Yeah. Which is pretty great. I mean, and that's like, uh, you know, we, we have to do clearance sales, you know, all the time and, and that, you know, brings down the margin, but our initial markup is usually around 67%. And then, you know, as uh, you know, we give discounts for various things or we have sales and clearance sales and stuff like that. You know, our margin at the end of the day ends up being around 53%. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we, we aim for like 64% that that's like the ideal um but typically it ends up around 62 63 something like that um and yeah it's you know it's a business that is great because you're not just selling things you're actually giving people cash so anytime you have you have a business where people can come in and not spend money rather you know rather than spend money they can leave with more cash than they came in with you know that's something that people are going to go for generally uh people are going to like that um yeah and also, it's and fun I mean, too you know it's fun oh, to go in there and figure out like i used to love um you know roger dunn's golf stores they would allow you to bring in old clubs and trade them in and get credit for new stuff and they were the only shop the golf store at the time like this is back maybe like 20 years ago that did that and i would just only go there because you know who wants your old shit yeah. when you're gonna upgrade yeah Exactly. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and I, I think that's, that's uh, going to continue to be a really good opportunity, especially now with, uh, you know, this economic downturn that's coming from this whole, uh, you know, virus thing, people are going to, you know, need money basically and want to sell. And that's, that's the one thing that I'm, uh, you know, concerned about with when we reopen that, you know, all of a sudden it's just going to be all people coming to sell their because they're all stuck in their homes for, you know, months at a time. And all they got to do is go through their closets. And then all of a sudden we're going to open up our doors and, you know, there's going to be a line around the corner, people waiting to, waiting to take their money. (laughs) It's like a bank, (laughs) right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, you know, everybody. How does that work? Like, you don't have to buy stuff, do you? Or No, no. I mean, we, we accept, we accept like, you know, people bring in whatever they have and, you know, we go through it. We only buy the things that we know will sell for us. And, We'll only buy things that are clean and in very good condition and current styles. 
So, you know, usually if somebody brings in a big garbage bag full of stuff, maybe we'll end up buying five items and giving them like 20 bucks or something, or right. sometimes less, sometimes more, you know, some people you have give a, stuff. You give a bit more if they use it for merchandise too, right? Is there a difference? Um, no, we don't, we don't actually. Buffalo Exchange does it. So that's yeah. probably what you're thinking of. Yeah, they give you like a percentage discount if you trade. Uh, for us, oh. Hi. Hi. Hey, Diff. Hi. <laughs> What's or up? Or not. Yeah. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, because this is a show. Yeah, I'm on the headphones. That's my sister, everybody. First time Hi. on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there she is. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Do a at she's, home bullshit workout. Yep. Nice. She's, uh, <laughs> she's stuck working from home like everybody else out here. <laughs> You're working out? Yeah. All right, good. At least she's working. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are yeah, out of jobs. I know. Oh, I know. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen with uh, with her job, her, uh, you know, business coming up. Yeah. Like, uh, they have a conference call scheduled on Monday to go over everything, but yeah. So well, uh, liquor distribution is hopefully yeah. gonna yep. gonna stay afloat. People need to oh, drink. People need to drink. Yeah. The, the problem is the events. You know, that's what she what she does is does events for uh, liquor business. All these music festivals and you know yeah. everything's getting canceled. All the stuff that they would usually be at um, is done, which. They still made her go to Denver this last weekend, so which I was not very thrilled about, but she made it back. No coronavirus here. Oh wow! Fingers, fingers I crossed. wish she would have. Um, I wish she would have picked up my car in Denver and drove it back. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> and drove it back to New York. Yeah, I've got the uh, a Turo uh, rental car sitting out there, and it's just sitting there. And uh, now that no one's renting it, I'm paying these people to manage it to park it in their lot and i'd rather i'd rather you guys have it <laughs> yeah oh i'm sure turo is probably going to get hit by this i don't know what their policy is with this there, yeah, sure they're getting smashed. Um, so uh, well, yeah what happened with your business yeah I, I well, well before you go into that <laughs> tell um before before you go into that um well, I, I just want i think everyone probably has a pretty good idea of how the business works um mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, what was it like to start it and to, you know, to build it up? Because you opened a new franchise. Um, yep. what's, what's that process like? You, you have to pay a, a franchise fee, right? Yeah. And then yeah, so, uh, walk us so, through that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you obviously you pay a franchise fee. Um, you know, with that, you get, uh, you know, all their support, basically, training. They kind of... Uh, you know, this is a this is a large franchisor. They have like two thousand stores across across all their brands. Um, so they're you know not every franchise is going to work the same. Some a lot of franchises are smaller where uh, you know they don't have the same resources or the same like you know years of experience in the same business that Winmark does. Um, and you know I have a friend that also has franchise has a franchise business which we can talk about later, but. Uh, we'll talk about myself first. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a large franchisor, so they really have a, have a wealth of resources, and their offices are in Minneapolis. So when you start it off, uh, you know you go out there. There's two weeks of training. You do week one training, which is to try and you know they basically train you how to set up a business, even if you have no idea what you're doing. Like you know, if you you're coming from working a retail job, you have no business experience at all. They basically kind of walk you through everything. You know, from business. What's loan. the uh, what's the fee? Uh, the initial franchise fee. Um, I forget actually off the top of my head what it was. Um, it's changed over time. I believe it was like uh, uh, I think it's like twenty five thousand dollars, something like that, or maybe more. I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to give a number really on that. Because yeah, some some somewhere that in point. that ballpark. Yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and then. Uh, you know, so they train uh, you. They train you. They train you everything that you have to do. To, if you need to take out loans or whatever, we financed it ourselves, so we didn't take out any loans to start it up. Um, and to open up the store costs about three hundred fifty thousand dollars around. You know, it, it'll be anywhere between like two fifty and four hundred. Uh, you know, depending on where you're located, what kind of you know what size store you get. Um, 
you know, so you pay like, you pay a nominal fee compared to the upfront cost of actually you know getting the location yeah yeah the, stock yeah, the some current, of it i'm guessing with merchandise inventory yeah, mm-hmm. yeah so that, that's where our business is different getting started you you start out with no inventory you can't just like you know go to a manufacturer and place an order and say look we need this many pairs of jeans we need this many shirts and whatever you know yeah. you have to, we have, so with uh winmark what they do is uh you have to open up for a long time only buying and not selling anything so that's where a lot of your oh that's interesting from. so yeah You're basically so first, buying <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Very, very funny. So, yeah so you basically can't sell anything for the first hmm. you know however long it takes to get to a certain inventory level for us it was actually pretty quick because we we were so busy right from the start um mm-hmm. i think it took us about five weeks before we could do our grand opening um and so you know people are coming in and selling stuff and you're not you're not uh, taking in any income for a while. So that's a little bit weird. And uh, yeah, it's always a little like unsettling. You don't know whether you're going to sell it or not. And then you kind of open up and you see what happens. Um, it, it took us a while to kind of get, get going in this market because it's a new market. It was a new market for the brand. So it has no name recognition here at all. Um, you know, a lot of people across the country know Plato's Closet. They've grown up with it. It's been around for a long time. Um, here, that didn't exist. Um, so it took us a little while and, you know, since we opened, we've, every single year we've grown. Um, and, you know, every single year we've set our, we've set a record basically for sales. And this year we were on pace to, to do even better. Uh, at, at the point where we shut down, our business was up about uh, like, I think it was up to like 18% year to date. Uh, our February, we did about 45% more sales than we did last year in February. Um, yeah. it, was a leap, it was a leap year, so that includes an extra day, but that an extra day doesn't mean anything. In this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, last year in February, we did 70,000 in sales. This year, we did 100,000. So, it was, uh, you know, it was on pace to be a great year. And then uh, this obviously hit. Uh, I closed my store uh, on Monday at one o'clock. We, we were going to open for the rest of the day and I got, I went in there and we were completely dead. So I just said, just shut it down. Um, do the responsible thing and, you know, keep people at home because the people in our demographic are the young people that are going to want to push through this whole thing and say, you know, screw social distancing. <laughs> I'm going to go and shop and do this and do whatever. So, you know, I feel like, uh, it's the right thing for me to do my part and, uh, and kind of put put aside business needs for now and try and make sure we can get through this as quick as possible um what what's but, your um so how many employees do you have and what's the monthly kind of burn rate if you're totally shut down so uh i have 15 employees currently um you know they're all i have one full-time which is my manager um the rest of them are all part time, and you know the good thing with them is they're mostly like you know young students, high school kids, stuff like that. They don't have mm-hmm. kids that they're supporting. They don't have families, so like, you know, I don't feel as guilty about not paying them because they're hourly workers, and I honestly I just can't afford to keep paying them during it. Yeah. Um, so you know, besides that, so cost, they're hour so that because they're hourly, they're basically not getting anything. Or they have benefits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they don't have benefits. No, uh-huh. um, and my manager doesn't either. So I'm not. I don't. I don't give up. I don't have any uh, anybody that has benefits. Um, so know, that's easy. That's a zero. It's a zero yeah. for employees. Okay, because that's a for huge employees. issue yeah, for, me. for a lot of businesses. Issue. I mean, yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. and that's going to be a that's going to be a problem for anybody that has a lot of full time employees. And that's mm-hmm. why in this situation, like the entrepreneur and the small business owners are really getting screwed over, uh, you know, because they're going to pass legislation to really help with employees and with all those paid sick leaves and stuff. And big corporations generally, you know, they can take hits like that. Um, and so if you're somebody that works for a large company and you're in this situation, you know, you can, you can feel better about the prospects going forward than if you're somebody that owns a small business where, the uncertainty is really uh, a tough thing to kind of deal with and process. Um, so those that aren't in business right now and don't own their own business, 
Um, you know, I think that's where a lot of opportunity is going to come from this. Um, and for those that do own small businesses, we just got to kind of do what we can to stay afloat. You know, I, I kind of have cut all of my costs as much as possible. You know, I'm not going to be paying my employees. Um, I'm going to try and put off my rent here and there, but you know, I'm going to have to pay the rent eventually, I think. And that's another, another thing, by the way, that's going to get impacted is, uh, you know, landlords are going to get hurt a lot by it because, uh, you know, in the U S now they're putting up all, uh, um, foreclosures and they're stopping evictions. So, uh, really? I have friends that are, yeah. So I have friends that are landlords and they are stopping all evictions. So you can't evict anybody for not so, paying. Wow. For not paying. Yeah. I have to figure Which, out what's going on with that in Ukraine because, um, you know, yeah. as, as you know, and most of the people listening, I have a pretty significant side business of uh, yeah. vacation rental properties. And, you know, I've got 10 units here in Kiev that all had, you know, thousands of dollars of bookings in March. And uh, all of those bookings were canceled. <laughs> as yeah. soon as Airbnb posted, like, you, anyone can cancel their bookings. Um, everyone canceled yeah. and you know, that turned from like, uh, maybe a $15,000 profit to like a $7,000 loss. Yeah. So like a $20,000 swing overnight. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Yeah. And but if I yeah, didn't have to pay my rent, right. You know, like yeah. if I didn't have to pay the landlord for rent. Obviously that would stop the bleeding. But, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, and, and I don't know, and I don't know what's going to come of it in the long term. If you know somebody can't pay their rent for three months, and the landlord's sitting here like and got to pay their mortgage or pay whatever else they got to pay. Right, the landlord's got to pay the mortgage. They got to pay the yeah. electricity, or well, I mean, I have to pay the electricity. But they got to pay the property taxes. Yeah, taxes. Yeah. 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 And Which so, is like, a, another governmental thing, you know, like if the government says, okay, well, you don't have to pay your mortgage and the landlords and say, well, I don't want to pay my fucking taxes. And then bye yeah. bye government, you know, exactly. Subsidy. Yeah. So like, yeah. so that'll be, so that'll be a, something that I have no idea what's going to happen with. And it'll be really kind of interesting to see what happens. Cause yeah, they did stop all evictions. So now as a landlord, if somebody's not paying their rent, that thing that you could evict somebody that's gone. And with those those laws in New York State anyway they had uh, they'd really uh, made those laws tighter on evictions um, yeah. in recent days and uh, so it's been kind of tough on landlords anyway without this thing uh, just New York State and every uh, every state has their own thing with you know how evictions are processed and everything and uh, well now they're the entire country is pretty much they're not allowing you to evict people and uh, you know I have a cousin that owns buildings in Harlem. Uh, you know, in low income areas, large buildings with, you know, 200 units. And, you know, he's, there, he's I mean, that's he's, millions he's really of dollars. It. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of money. And uh, so, so he's definitely concerned about it. And he's, he's also a financial manager as well. So he's got that end too. So, um, I mean, that's going to, re- that, I didn't realize that that's going to really, really impact people because there's so many people that have built you know, uh, wealth through real estate. Yeah. Yeah. And if you tell tenants that they don't have to pay rent, no one's going to pay rent. No, they're not going to. Yeah. And you know, and it's basically, it's like, gotta, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. You, you got to hope for like the goodwill of some people that are still getting paid, that they're still going to pay their rent. But you know, you got to expect if people are being told that there's no recourse, if they don't, then yeah. they might not, even if they're still getting paid, even if this thing isn't impacting them. Because this thing isn't impacting everybody. There's some businesses that are. It's a business you know, decision to not pay. Fuck it. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't pay. I mean, it's no. just, yeah. Yeah, and then I don't know what's going to happen in the long term, whether they can recoup that those missed payments or what. Or what kind well, of the banks also have. can't foreclose, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's some recourse for the, land, the landlords. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah, the banks are going to. It just kind of puts the whole economy into a, you know, just a shutdown mode. Pretty which much. Which eventually yeah. puts people into a starvation mode. Yeah. So, exactly. uh, I mean, That's what we're dealing with. Think right about now. the doomsday apocalypse sort of. Yeah, foresight. and that, 
and that's kind of the thing that I, I've been trying to focus on, you know, uh, it's just men- mental health in this kind of situation. It's very mm-hmm. easy to really get sucked into uh, like thinking about all the possibilities and what's going on and reading the news, especially if there's, you know, my outlet is sports. Like I watch sports all the time. I'm a huge sports fan. There's no sports to watch. That's my distraction. You know, what else can I do? I, you know, I'll watch movies, I'll watch TV shows, but you know, it's hard to take your mind off of current events, uh, you know, without, without that kind of outlet. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I think. uh... No, no, sorry. Go ahead. A lot of what, what I think everybody should really, uh, uh, make important is their mental health and making sure that they stay positive through it. Um, even though it's a pretty terrible situation. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause, um, I'm, uh, you know, that's always kind of one of the things that I'm researching, trying to educate my clients on, um, just, you know, and, and I follow a lot of people in the mental health industry and, um, I've seen some really good advice on there that I'm going to try to regurgitate and what most people are saying. Um, and I'm also very plugged into like the doomsday prepper people. Um, I kind of got sucked in that world about five or six years ago. Um, it's uh, I don't know. It's just kind of one of the natural spinoffs of the entrepreneurial travel. Um, like the more you unplug from the U S the more you kind of plug into um, anarchists and, you know, anyone who's kind of like an anarchist is always a doomsday prepper. And yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, any, anyone who's kind of in crypto or right. They're always like, they're, they're, they're kind of like secretly betting for shit to hit the fan almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've read some interesting books on it. And the first when, when this first started kind of unraveling, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it's interesting because I'm here in Ukraine and basically there, it's, it's been a non-issue here, um, but I've been following U.S. news and, you know, the U.S. kind of went to zero from zero to a hundred real quick, right? They're like, once the Italy situation kind of happened, they're like, all right, we're, we're locking down. And Ukraine had two cases, but they followed they basically are just copying the U S day by day on what to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, we have two cases in all of Ukraine. We're shutting everything down. (laughs) Yeah. We're closing the borders. We're shutting everything down. Um, which is either due to corruption and they're lying about the number of people dying and whatever, or they're just Mm -hmm. taking a really preemptive uh, stance on it, which, you know, I, I I think that's probably the case. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good move. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Um, you know, it's, so it's the same situation. All businesses are closed. Um, the only thing open supermarkets, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, pharmacies and banks basically. Mm Um, and you know, no travel in and out, no nothing. So, but there's somehow there's still traffic in the city. I don't know how. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, there's still people walking around. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, you know, they're not like finding people to go outside like they are in Italy and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, my initial response was, fuck, I better go and prepare for like basically the grid going offline and all of these worst case scenarios, not in like a, oh my God, this is doomsday. Everything. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Everything's going to shit sort of thing. But so basically everyone's going to have their own cognitive bias, right? Either you're like a doomsday, like everything's going to shit or you're a, Oh, this is all marketing bullshit or media hype and bullshit and everything's going to be fine in a week. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, wherever you are in that spectrum is where you are, but you don't know. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You really don't know. No one knows. And that bias is either, you know, it's either going to really help you. It's really going to hurt you, but Mm -hmm. either way, you're going to have massive anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I think the the key from a mental health perspective is you have to prepare for the worst. So you can then remove the anxiety 
from that situation. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so the first thing yeah. I did was I bought enough food for a month. Um, I made sure <laughs> Christina <laughs> thought I was crazy because she's the yeah. Ukrainian. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a joke. Uh, second time during one week, I mined food for two weeks. Right. Everyone's like buying food and then cooking and then using everything. And like, yeah, <laughs> for one week. But um, I, I went to a gun store and, and picked up a gun um, just because I, I know what happens when, you know, yeah, when, when, the, when the grid goes offline and people get hungry, people get angry and they're going to mm-hmm. find food. Um, and not because I think that'll happen. I think there's an extremely mm-hmm. little chance it'll happen, but I want to be prepared if it does because I can yeah. sleep better at night. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, in that way, like I can just totally unplug from the news. I don't have to watch it. I don't have to give a fuck what's going on. And I can just focus on business, which is making content, which we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, whatever else I can do to kind of pass the time and use it as, a, as an advantage to uh, whatever I think will happen in the future, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my take yeah. on it. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's something that, yeah, you, you gotta, uh, you gotta be prepared uh, for all situations. You know, I'm, I'm usually on the end of uh, the, you know, eternal optimist where I think, you know, everything is going to be fine and everything. Um, and I was saying that up until about two weeks ago and you know, I was planning on traveling. I'd like to, to LA. We're supposed to leave on Tuesday. Um, and I was always, you know, planning on doing it and everything. And then, you know, as, as the news starts to get worse and worse and really when the sports league started canceling, that's when it, it got serious for me. Um, <laughs> but right. yeah, but, um, so like, you know, since then I've really kind of, uh, I'm, I'm taking this pretty seriously and, uh, you know, preparing, I, I, I still haven't, I haven't gone and like bought months worth of food. Uh, you know, the good thing here is that we have Uber Eats and DoorDash and all these companies are still delivering. And, you know, the restaurants are going to stay open because they're going to get hit so hard by this. Um, so they're going to yeah. do everything they can uh, to stay alive. And, uh, you know, so I, I kind of know that we're, we're always going to have that option of ordering into restaurants. And, you know, I believe in supporting small businesses and these restaurants are going to be hurting. So yeah. I want to, uh, you know, I want to order food from them as much as possible to, you know, kind of, just, just help support them so that they could stay afloat. You know, some restaurants that I love that I, you know, don't want to go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's, I, I don't know what the situation is in Ukraine with that, if they have the same. The same exact aspect. thing, but you know, what you have to consider, and this is maybe me being more on the bias of the doomsday prepper side, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. is all of those restaurants are going to be operating at a pretty significant loss. Yeah. You know, because they don't have the capabilities of, they don't have margins that allow for delivery. Yeah. And exactly. it's only a matter of time before they decide to close their doors. Mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. you know, the more businesses close their doors and the more desperate people get, right? Like, mm-hmm. hopefully the food supply chain stays afloat, which seems like it's probably really, you know, benefiting. And it's like as fast as motherfuckers are you know, bombing down to Costco and buying everything. They're restocking yeah. the shelves. Like the oh, yeah. supply chain is, is pretty incredible. How yeah, they're... it really is. <laughs> you know, yeah. but Americans are nuts. Like it's not oh, it's yeah. like my, my, the joke I've been using. It's like when things are good, Americans buy a lot of shit. So when <laughs> things are bad, they buy more shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> Let's yeah. buy more shit. <laughs> it's different shit. It's different shit. Yeah. Now there's a, run, there's a run on gym equipment, there's a run on guns, and there's a run on toilet paper. Who would have thought? Gym That's equipment? Like, oh, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. My Instagram feed is, is filled with just uh, you know, gym I equipment. can understand oh, guns because guns I mean, are I, like – but but gym equipment? Like Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, went, to, I went to Dick's Sporting Goods. <laughs> they, were, they were out of free weights. They had no free weights left. They were – seriously i'm not even joking they they had like very minimal amount of like fitness bands and you know because people gyms are closed every gym is closed down so you know people are if they're going to be stuck in their house you know every day people need to work out and they want to you know 
they want to feel like they're doing something. So, you know, even if they're not going to use it, they're going to buy it and say, look. That's just the most crazy <laughs> consumerist mentality because you could, you can just use body weight and do push-ups. You and, can. Yeah, you, you know, can. You like can. there's so many workouts you can do. And there's so many workout yeah. programs that teach you how to get absolutely jacked with nothing. Yeah. I mean, like literally thing, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean the workout equipment that I bought, I bought two mats, yoga mats, and so that we can yeah, you know, you do stuff that. like that. And I got a medicine ball too for Niffy. She wanted a medicine ball, so I got her a medicine ball. Um, Whatever. That's the, yeah. But uh, but yeah. <laughs> but buying and for ordered, your, and she ordered yeah, it's she ordered funny. a Peloton bike too. So you know, and people are all thinking the same same way. They want to get gym equipment, and I'm seeing it all over my Instagram feed different friends that are like, you know, installing new treadmills or like they're doing this and that. And, you know, people that go to the gym every day, this is going to, this is going to really like, you know, like mess, mess with them basically, because, you know, people have a routine and they go to the gym in the morning, they go to work, they do that. And without that routine, yeah. you know, a lot of people are going to really uh, struggle with it. Um, now I'm not a person that I don't work out every day. Um, so it's not as big of a concern to me. So I don't see that, but it's um you know something that's gonna have to kind no, of get do it. to keep our sanity but yeah, yeah. You, can use, you can use your own body weight you can do push-ups sit up stuff like that and i'm gonna start well i think i think it's just a, it's a i don't know i could be thinking about it wrong but i think it's a really really bad investment because it's only gonna play out in a couple ways right like yeah either shit's gonna reopen soon and life will go back to normal or it's just gonna get really fucking bad and no one gives a fuck about working out when they're in survival yeah. mode, right? Yep. So investing in gym, home gym equipment is, I yeah. think, one of the dumbest things you could do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. know, like, I think investing you know, I, in, in home protection is important because, yeah. you know, if you're prepared for the worst, then you don't need to have anxiety about it happening. Um, and, like, the, the stuff that people are buying from the stores is absolutely mind-blowing. It's like... Mm -hmm. We're going to buy, like, my, my buddy who lives in Minnesota, he went to the store and he's like, I couldn't find any bread. The entire bread aisle was completely decimated. Yeah. Bread is the fastest thing to perish. Like, bread yeah, lasts for, for what? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty close. Like, let's buy all the bread and, and yeah. put all the bread in the pantry and it's all going to go bad. <laughs> yeah. People like, think if they buy a lot of it, it'll be fine. <laughs> right. It was yeah. buy all the bread. It, it, it's yeah. like, what the fuck? So what, what people should be buying um, for anyone who's interested in that is it, coconut <laughs> milk. <laughs> yeah, we have a big stash of coconut milk because you don't need to refrigerate it. And it's, uh, yeah, and I'm drinking coconut milk. But she's crazy. So I'm, I'm, I, I disapprove of the coconut milk purchase. That's really how much coconut milk do you need when shit hits the fan. But um, if there's, <laughs> there's th three foods that are vitally important that can keep you alive forever, that will ne really never go bad. That's canned tuna, uh, saltine crackers, and canola oil. And if you can live on saltine crackers, canola oil, and canned tuna, on a desert island, just make sure you bring a can opener that's not electric because the batteries will die. Uh, <laughs> you can live on that shit. You can live on that shit forever. And, um, you know, so if, if you have that, some home protection, what you know. What do you have? Uh, tuna? Can, get, uh, tuna, <laughs> canola yep. oil. And uh, so rice is better than, than saltines. It tastes a lot better. Yeah. yeah uh, but if you, have, yeah. if you have no electricity and you have no way to cook the rice, then saltines are better. Um, yeah. But, you know, canola oil, tuna, and rice, it's not terrible. Like, you're going to get real sick of it after a month. But, yeah. I mean, the, the thing that most people need to kind of embrace is that if, you know, it, the, the thing that seems crazy but isn't that crazy is if the power grid goes down. If electricity goes down, then everything's fucked. Like, yeah. Uh, a lot of plumbing doesn't work without electricity. Mm -hmm. So now you're in a situation where you can't wash anything. You can't use the bathroom unless you go outside um, mm -hmm. and you got the lights off and yeah. that opens up, that opens yourself up for like, you know, people coming and doing things at night that you don't want them to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now I, now like, I can really see your uh, doomsday prepper side coming out here. With the, uh, well, the electricity if the power grid down. goes down, then everything goes down, right? And what's going to stop yeah. those power workers? Like, who's in charge of Con Ed out there? 
right? Like that yeah. shit stays on, but it doesn't take a whole lot. Like, let's just say, you know, it's March right now in New York. What, mm-hmm. what if Hurricane Sandy comes in and mm-hmm. takes out the power grid? You know, that, that's not a far-fetched scenario. But yeah. if that happens, then people absolutely lose their shit because they're already mm-hmm. freaked out. So th- mm-hmm. like when everyone's in panic mode and then something else happens, that's when you have all shit hits the fan. And yeah. it's not that far-fetched for a hurricane to hit New York or, you know, a, a huge like freezing rain storm, yeah. you know, like that could easily happen. Take out the power and you've got scared people who are now desperate and crazy and psycho buying toilet paper. Yeah. And now they're just, you know, you've got, you've got the walking yeah. dead without the zombies. Or like, I mean, th- there was an earthquake in Salt Lake City the other day. I don't know if you heard about that, but yeah, there was an earthquake. Exactly. Was a magnitude earthquake. I mean, it's, that's not enough to cause crazy damage, but you know. Mother Nature doesn't stop for uh, epidemics, you know. Right. So, it's not. It's not know, the it, actual disease. It's not the actual like the danger isn't so much. Like obviously, we don't know a whole lot about you know COVID nineteen to know how deadly it really is. It doesn't seem that bad, but the danger is the people's fear and yeah. people going into panic mode and it creating chaos. So yeah. you're already in a situation with chaos. You add a, another thing, then you have crazy chaos. And yeah. what's more dangerous than a disease is a bunch of angry humans mm-hmm. that are out yeah. to get each other and to survive. Exactly. So that's, that's what I think, like, that was my initial, once I started closing stuff, I'm like, okay, I need to be prepared for that. Um, so, you know, I've got food, I've got some weapons. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a situation where I don't have to commute to work or whatever. So I'm good for that, which allows me to then focus on other shit. But I think most mm-hmm. people, um, I, I think they could really benefit from just kind of having that awareness. So then they could also not have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're aware of all these possible outcomes and you don't, you know, your anxiety can go down and if you're, you know, if you're prepared for everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There, there's a there's a lot of really uh, a lot of ends of this um, spectrum uh, to look at. There's so many uh, you know ramifications that are going to come from this uh, from this epidemic that uh, remain to be seen. And yeah, the power grid stuff that that's scary. But well, you, know, you have you have the stuff. three you have your three needs, which is food, shelter, water. You mm-hmm. know, you can survive for thirty days mm-hmm. with water and no food yeah. and shelter. Um, but if you lose power and you're in a really cold climate or a fucking, you know, a, a, you know, bad weather hits New York City or hits Kiev or hits Moscow, you know, it can get, it was snowing here three days ago. So if you, you lose electricity, you lose shelter. And <laughs> once you lose shelter, yeah. it's real dangerous. And, yeah. and if you lose electricity, you also lose water for the most part. Yeah. So I'm, still, you know, I'm just it, still worried about, I'm, I'm worried about losing golf right now. That's, <laughs> that's the one thing i was thinking about golf, is like golf, golf, golf. Down. are they yes yeah i mean I, I that's the thing i wish i was in the u.s the most for is because i'm sure you could like i love yeah. golfing alone and playing yeah. as many holes as possible i'm sure there's no one out there you can just keep <laughs> playing you can get in 72 yeah. a day i mean a lot of people <laughs> have the same idea because it's great it's a great social distancing activity um right you know especially if you're not not using a golf cart you know you walk yeah uh, and the local uh, municipal course right by me is still open um i, I read Saturday. the most hilarious uh, oh go ahead sorry but but yeah a lot of a lot of golf courses are now starting to close uh my dad's down in florida and uh a bunch of the country clubs are closing down um probably could, because know, it's too expensive to keep the staff on and to uh no it's it's really not because a lot of them I think a lot of them tried to stay open and they're keeping their maintenance staff on. Um, but I think uh, it's, they're starting to see like dangers of it spreading. Like a lot of clubs are like taking the flag stick out. My dad's club, they didn't close, but they decided they're not putting flag sticks in and they got <laughs> yeah, this, and no rake. Too. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this. Flag stick. Yeah. 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 So, so look at this, look at this message. It says, uh, well, it's going to be backwards, right? So I'll read it. It says no, we have I, implemented, I oh, we have implemented the below golf specific maintenance practices 
wiping down with disinfectant to help prevent the spread of germs. Golf carts with particular attention to steering wheels, seat handles, keys, key tags, push-pull rental <laughs> cart handles, range basket handles, on-course flag sticks, ball washers, rental clubs, issue scorecards and pencils by request only, and removed all the rakes from the bunkers. <laughs> yeah. That's what, I mean, that's what they're going to have to do. They got to like shut if, down their clubhouses, just have like an honor system or something, like a cash envelope thing. You put it, put in your green speed and you go out and you do it. You don't have to touch anything. Well, if, even if that's they close, it. you can just go play. I know that's yeah. Right. That's, yeah. That's <laughs> Who's going to yeah. be there to stop you? That's, you know? that's what I was thinking. If I, uh, you know, if the world you shuts just sneak down, on. I'm, dri- I'm driving out to the Hamptons and playing Shinnecock. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fuck. You know, that's, uh, yeah. that's but, a great idea. But, yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know how they're gonna. They're gonna have to step up their security. I don't know. They don't want uh, random people just coming out and messing around. But yeah, crazy, crazy shit. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I I'll shut up about my doomsday sort of spiel. Let's go back to businesses, not as usual, but business in this time. So, what yeah. is your what do you do over the next month, two, three? What's your prediction on how long this shit's going to go? And, um, you know, they, so you, you still have to pay your rent or is that, can you um, not I'm, pay because? Of- I'm in negotiations with the landlord. We're, we're trying to come up with something. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm just not, I just, I don't want to pay really. Um, I've been discussing with my dad also. Um, and he was, he was saying that we should pay half the rent and, I mean, I don't, I don't even want to pay half the rent, honestly. I, we can we can pay it back over time. This applies to businesses too. But it's tough. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. There, there hasn't been – I haven't really seen the guidance relating to businesses that much. Um, you know, I, uh, I haven't really read up on it enough. Um, so, well, I'm they can't of, evict you. No, they can't evict us. Um, oh, wow. So this, okay, so yeah. this commercial and, and residential. I mean, uh, don't quote don't quote me on that because I didn't yeah. read anything about the commercial side of it. But I know they stopped evictions. On this the, is only in New York. Or is this um, nationwide? Um, I believe it's nationwide. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I believe it's nationwide. I know it's in New York um, for sure. Right. Um, because I, I have a good friend of mine owns a bunch of rental properties. And, you know, he's going through this. Um, he has a bunch of rental properties in New Jersey as well, and. I think they have the same thing, which they stopped evictions. Um, you know, so they're going to, you know, going to lose his, those rent, that rental income. So, you know, for me, with as far as our rent is concerned, um, you know, we have enough cash that we could stay afloat for uh, for a few months and, and be okay. Um, but, you know, after a month, we're going to have to see where, where things are and reassess and just, basically reassess almost like every week and, and see what's going on. Um, you know, I initially announced that we're just going to close until the end of May. Uh, I mean, the end of March. And, uh, but it's probably going to be longer than that. Now I'm realizing. Um, yeah. You know, what happens if it's three, what if it's three months? Yeah, I mean, it's so your, your burn rate is basically just rent. It's uh yeah. Rent. I mean, our utilities, obviously I shut off all of the power there. So like, you know, Mm. Our utility bills are going to be minimal. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I have a spreadsheet of uh, all my expenses. Um, you know, it's interesting I have- because I, I, I think the franchise business model is a great model. Um, mm-hmm. It's very similar to a vacation rental income. You know, you're, you're looking at a business that you can start that creates semi-passive income. Um, mm-hmm. People like to call it passive income, but it's never truly passive, right? There's always some management. Um, yeah, but, it, it depends on it depends on the franchise, of course, too. Uh, right. Yeah, but yours is very beginning. similar to mine. You you have a manager that kind of handles all the day to day, and mm-hmm. that allows you to essentially walk away and only deal with fires to put out. Yeah. Which is and, and um, that's, and that's yeah. the way I that's the way I I cho- choose to run it. And uh, sorry, yeah. hold on. What's going on with my speaker here? Oh, built in output. Christina, you're too far away with your ear pods. I need the. Yeah, I need. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. 
Okay. Um, you were too yeah. far away, so it fucked up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, that that's the way. I, that's. Okay. So um. Oh, so I was saying, the uh. Oh, no, go ahead. I lost you. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. The uh. You know, when you say passive income, you know that's kind of the way I've chosen to run it over the last just just couple of years. But you know, we've been in business since 2014. For the first three years, uh, I was very very heavily involved. So it was not not even remotely passive, especially, especially for the first two years. Um, you know, the first year of the store, I was basically there open to close every day, which 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 12 to 6 on Sunday. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very, so, it, you know, it's a lot of setup. It's so a lot of setup. As, uh, yeah. Yeah. As much, as much as it can be passive income, uh, it's very much not passive to start it. Um, and so that, that's where it's a little bit different with, you know, with the the vacation rentals and stuff you know i think am i right that you can kind of you can kind of start it up and and set set up your thing and then it becomes passive it could probably become passive pretty quickly uh whereas this it's a retail business so you got to really focus every day and you know make sure i don't don't know enough about the vacation rental thing so you can speak more to that side of it but um it's it's not terribly different um if i mean knowing what i know and i have a course where i teach um you know how to basically start this business and very quickly um systematize and optimize so you can remove yourself but for me like i think it's it's kind of like the same time frame at first if you if you know really nothing and there's a learning curve it's going to take you a couple of years minimum to kind of um, understand the business well enough where you can hire a manager to take over for you. Um, yeah. um, no, it, it, it's, I was basically saying like how long it takes to go from semi-passive to passive income. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you make the money when you sign the deal, whether you, you know, agree to a long-term lease and then you, do the vacation rental arbitrage business where you rent it out nightly and you know, you're paying a a yearly cost. So you're making the spread of money there Um, or you buy a place, right? And you get a good deal on the, on the property and your mortgage payment is less than what you're bringing in from, you know, the nightly rentals. Um, But the, you can get it to the point where it's basically passive income in the sense, if you can, hire a city manager to deal with all of the turnovers, so all the cleanings, all the maintenance, all the getting people in and out. Um, and also if they're responding to all the messages. So do, dealing with all the bookings. Yeah, um, yeah. And it takes, probably takes a good six months to a year to understand pricing and dealing with people and doing the bookings to, to feel comfortable handing that over. Kind of mm-hmm. like it, probably took you to kind of hand it over to a manager but in the meantime in the meantime like you know it's not the worst thing ever like to just deal with messaging with people back and forth and accepting reservations you know like when i get when i get a notification on my phone saying you know hans from germany just (laughs) submitted a booking request for five thousand dollars for you know a weekend in may i'm like great like that's yeah <laughs> it's not exactly uh, having to work your ass off there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice kind of side business to run, yeah. um, and most of the time it's very safe. You know, everyone needs places to stay. Everyone, you know, there's always tourists coming, and people. It's a commodity, right? People need housing. <laughs> yeah. Except when there's a yeah, worldwide definitely. pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, <laughs> and then your super safe side yeah. income generating machine just decides to go kaput and become yeah. your biggest liability, yeah. um, which yeah. is, you know, which is why, why I'm really glad I'm kind of diversified in, I have a business, you know, this, this coaching business or this, uh, content business, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. where even though, you know, like no matter how bad the economy is or anything's going, like people still, you know, want to yeah. improve their social skills or, you know, 
yeah. find a girl or get laid or anything in between, you know? So like yeah. until shit gets so bad that like everyone's just, you know, basically yeah. robbing each other, hopefully yeah. you know, the and intercom in this business stays afloat. <laughs> And if, if you're if you're single right now, it's gonna be tough to get laid too. It's, uh, you know, bar, you have to, no bars open, nobody's leaving their house. It's, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I need to come out with a with a coronavirus uh, online dating program. Um, yeah, so. yeah. Video dating of some sort. <laughs> right. So, uh, people, people are gonna get very lonely from this. I, I feel like after after a while, you know, all the single people are gonna get let out of their homes, and it's gonna be just a. Uh, <laughs> gonna be a beehive of activity oh my god yeah <laughs> once sure the bars open th oh, that yeah. first the first night the bars are open like everyone needs to go oh, out because it's gonna be like halloween uh, on steroids oh my god yeah yeah imagining that is crazy i mean that's something to look forward to that's how we can uh we can keep our mental uh mental health intact say <laughs> totally. looking forward you know when it opens yeah. up it'll be pretty crazy yeah but um yeah this is one of those situations where it's uh it's it's tough being stuck in your house for sure but uh we'll get used to it it's it's nice um oh, yeah. not being on quarantine alone yeah um, like that's i hope this will be a wake up call for a lot of people who are too introverted and 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 kind of like too focused on kind of the wrong things to realize that like, you know, if you're stuck with nothing to do, your company matters more than anything. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's, you know, you know, a lot of people that are just, you know, that are out there just dating, messing around, um, you know, not looking for relationships, their, their mind might change after this because they're going to be uh, at home <laughs> like, man, I wish I maybe stayed with that girl a little longer. And Yeah. I know, wish I had my like, coronavirus girlfriend uh, exactly <laughs> my uh, quarantine yeah. girl and that, uh, that'll be interesting to see what happens with the dating scene after this uh you know that's another end of the spectrum that you know i'm sure you're gonna you're gonna be answering questions on um that will be interesting to see uh you know i yeah. know it, it, and a lot of that depends how long this thing goes you know if it goes two or three months i think it'll just be you know, it'll be crazy for a while and then we'll be back to normal pretty quick. But if this thing lasts six months, a year or something like that, then uh, we'll see what really happens there. Yeah. But, but I think, but yeah. um, you know, I, I think a really good kind of, I guess, final thought or takeaway is, right, you have the, op so you're going to have your bias of either doomsday or no big deal. Recognize your bias, prepare for either scenario. Mm -hmm. um and then really focus on like how you can how you can profit off this long term yeah because and, and, you know and something that i'm i'm looking at doing in this you know it's going to give us a lot of time to spend um and you know not as much things to do a lot of people that have jobs are going to be you know not they're just not going to be very busy um so i think it's a really good opportunity to just kind of maybe learn a new skill learn a new trade um, you know, I've been working on playing drums for a while and, uh, that's not, I'm not going to start making money off of that. I know that I'm not good enough for that, but <laughs> you know, it's something I'm going to use this time to practice that and get better, you know, spend an hour or so a day, you know, block out that time for that. Um, but if you were ever interested in starting getting into, you know, vacation rentals, it's a good time to start reading up on it and really, uh, really getting prepared, uh, especially because real estate prices are probably going to go down a lot. And if you're not currently in one of these businesses that's getting affected, there's probably going to be an opportunity after we get out of this to get into those businesses, I'm sure. Um, because, and it sucks for the people that are already in it, honestly, but for those that aren't, uh, you know, there's going to be opportunities that come up. And I think that's an important thing to, to, to do is spend some of your time alone learning and you know reading books watching videos whatever it may be and you know figuring out what you can do uh you know once we get out of this and try and monetize it basically because there's going to be opportunities and you know i'm looking at the stock market as, as an opportunity because it's dropping so much that um you know but that's something where you got to be careful you got to invest in companies that you know are going to survive no matter what 
because a lot of big companies are going to go out of business from this probably even some big airlines and stuff so you know that's something that you got to kind of be aware of when you're doing the stock market on times like these but um you know there will be opportunities and uh you know you'll have the time to really learn so that you can capitalize on it and uh, i think that's an important thing to think about yeah yeah it's like the um I don't know. There's a lot of speculation, obviously, but there's a few things that like if prices get really low that I would kind of, mm-hmm. kind of re pony up on, like I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in, in the crypto markets. Um, yeah, I am too. And you know, if, if I see kind of Bitcoin already dropped down to like 3,500 and I was like, Oh fuck, like <laughs> this yeah. could be bad. But on one hand I was like, Oh, it might be a good time to buy. So it's a good time to buy, honestly. I think. They're, yeah, they're back. I think it's back up to like fifty-five or something. It rallied today, but it's up a ton. yeah, it's it's it's, it's so it's speculative. It's at, at sixty-two yeah. hundred right now. Sixty-two. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. I'm kind of kicking myself for not buying it. You know, a few days ago it'll, at three. It'll drop. But it'll drop down again, though. I think because so, that's just the nature of fifteen. Been following it. Yeah. Yeah. It's if up fifteen percent it today. Time, it's, it's yeah it's just so hard to speculate on these things the only thing you can really do is prepare yourself for the worst situation stay stay out of the the fake news you know stay out of the fucking muck and focus yeah. on skills skills you can you can build during the time where you have nothing yeah. to do yeah, yeah exactly so. yeah t- take the time when you're home alone and, and you know work on yourself basically and uh you know that's what i'll try and do and uh you know, I'll obviously have to, you know, work on some things with my business and see what's, what's going to happen coming up. And it's, you know, impossible for me to predict it really. So I'm kind of like for now, just sitting on the sidelines and just, you know, trying to see what, what I can do. And uh, the interesting thing is in this franchise, what Winmark has put out um, guidance to tell, to like teach stories about social selling, to start selling stuff on social media and Instagram. And, mm-hmm. um, so they're, they're kind of telling all their franchisees to look into this. And uh, personally, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to really make sense for this business model. Um, I just don't think it's worth it to have to like, you know, set up a whole shipping department and have to get shipping equipment and stuff like this for to sell like a $6 t-shirt to somebody. It's like, eh, is that worth it? I don't know. It, you know, maybe I could do like $200 in sales a day or something, but you know, is that worth it to pay somebody for that to help out with it? Um, and I just, I don't really see it necessarily. Maybe things will change, but um, that's yeah. what some people in my business are doing. And you know, a lot of businesses are going to have to adapt. It's like a, like a wartime thing. Like, you know, Ford and uh, these auto manufacturers during World War II, they stopped making cars. They started making tanks. And now all these like uh, high-end manufacturers of cologne and like, uh, and perfume are making hand sanitizer now. A lot of distilleries yeah. in America are making hand sanitizer, and so that's that's kind of what's gonna. What's my gonna buddy, uh, my buddy show. who has uh, access to a supply chain of grocery stores here, like a direct access from mm-hmm. his buddy, he just bought mm-hmm. two tons of hand sanitizer that he's going to rebottle and repackage as Corona sanitizer. Oh my god! Which is. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> really terrible. It's Ukraine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, All you can say, Ukraine. Yeah, it's Ukraine. <laughs> so it's a uh, wild, wild west. But uh, well, cool, man. It's been great. Uh, I, I think yeah. this is will be valuable to a lot of people. Uh, people yeah. are probably having the same conversations, and um, you know, yeah. I, yeah, I, I hopefully people will. Uh, you know, benefit from our silly wisdom. Yeah. If not go fuck yourself. Go watch something <laughs> else. Hey, if they get one thing positive <laughs> from it, then that's great. If they yeah. don't, then whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, if the only thing you got from this is if you have some time and you have some money and your main business is going well, invest in some real estate, invest in a franchise that you enjoy that you can, you know, and like, mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of, really wealthy people that are doing pretty well with that strategy so yeah yeah Yeah. you just can't let the fear paralyze you kind of you gotta look for the opportunity where you can find it and that's it 
But thanks for having me. It was fun. All right. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Take it easy. Good luck over there. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes. Thank you.